Hello everyone, how's it going? It is Tyrnor as always and I want to bring you my opinionated look at the novel Before the Storm by Christy Golden which was released about three days ago as of the time of the release of this video, namely uh, this Tuesday. <laughs> uh, and before we begin I have to apologize for my long absence. In my defense, it is my final year in university and my thesis is still not complete and I still need to complete it. I'm taking a bit of time off since this novel is kind of a really big anticipated thing and I need to talk about it. Uh, but otherwise, videos should return normally uh, about two, we two weeks from now, uh, possibly even next week if uh, I really do hurry up with my thesis I suppose. So this video uh, I'm going to structure it uh, as follows. First off I'm going to give a spoiler free uh, sort of review of the book, uh, my opinion on it and then I'm going to talk about the retcons that happened in this book and new pieces of information that are not uh, necessarily relevant to just this book, uh, but rather that which are relevant to the entire story of Warcraft, and those will contain some minor spoilers, nothing really major, uh, and if it is major I will uh, mark it on the screen uh, with a sign somehow. And then I'm going to talk in depth about the novel, my opinion on it, and full spoilers ahead from there, obviously. Uh, so you know what you expect. So in regards to this novel, I am honestly not sure if I liked it, which is rare for a Christy Golden novel. It's not a bad piece of literature, it's just definitely not what I expected it to be. A point which is impossible to detail really without going into spoilers, uh, since it's obviously important to say why it was not what I expected, since it majorly impacts my opinion on it. I'm just going to say that if you decide to read this book, which is marketed as a prequel to Battle for Azeroth, specifically expecting to get a prequel to Battle for Azeroth, do not go in expecting to receive all of the answers and resolutions you might hope for. So if you keep that in mind, the question arises on whether I would recommend this book or not. And the answer is yes, I suppose I would. Although I definitely feel that it is one of the weaker novels uh, written by Christy Gold in the Warcraft universe, it is still a good enough read and you definitely won't get bored by it or anything like that. Uh, any further discussion is kind of impossible without going into spoilers and the spoiler section is really really long and I'm going to detail my thoughts in depth from there. Uh, but for now, uh, we have. I'm going to move on to new to what was retconned and new pieces of information and such and so. First off, the Storm in Church has a new leader, which is High Priestess Lorena. Uh, she's already an NPC in the Cathedral of Light. Hopefully, she, since she does not have the title of Bishop, she won't go evil. Who knows? The next thing is that Gen Greymane is apparently not an eloquent person, uh, despite, you know, in the novels which detailed the Second War and Beyond, and, uh, Beyond the Dark Portal, Gen Greymane would often hold uh, sort of mini speeches and rants because he liked the sound of his own voice so much and he thought he was such a great speaker. Uh, so you can consider that either a stealth retcon or a bit of character development, who knows. The next thing is that Anduin uh, does not know the workings of SI7, well, specifically certain secret operations that SI7 might have, which is a bit of a weird thing because if I think about, say, the President of the United States, him not knowing about top secret information by the secret services would seem kind of weird, at least, at least to me. Uh, and especially since Anduin, uh, this is a very minor spoiler, but especially since Anduin does not really trust Shaw, Master Shaw that much, it seems all the more weird for him not to try to know what SI7 is doing. 
The next thing is that there is only one group in all of Azeroth who has the financial power to finance the goblins mining Azerite in Silithus, and that is the Bilgewater Cartel, which seems to imply that the Bilgewater Cartel is the richest organi organization on Azeroth. Uh, I think they missed out on the fact that there are also other goblin cartels and uh, other organizations in the world. Well, I don't know, it seems a, a little bit off. The next uh, thing is how Azerite, uh, the mineral, works. Specifically, it works in a way which is very, which immediately made me think of uh, atomo, cry atomo crystals. Uh, namely, uh, they either give great insight, uh, they make your mind clearer, they uh, give the wielder some sort of great power and they uh, as right is also nigh indestructible it amplifies the effects of pretty much everything that it touches for example it can make poison a thousand times more lethal it can also make uh neutralize poison rather uh, depending on the quantities used it's uh, the book does a good job of explaining why as right is important the next thing is that the Korkron Guard still exists and is still active and is apparently only composed of orcs, despite the fact that we have seen Korkron NPCs from other races, no they are just orcs apparently. The next thing is the feast uh, which was held in the novel The Shattering for the Horde forces returning from Northrend was apparently Garrosh's idea instead of Thrall's. The next thing is, uh, which I thought was uh, kind of interesting, that the Horde, which is something pretty typical of how a state would operate in the medieval era, for instance, but the Horde does not have a permanent army. Instead, it raises its forces from each uh, of the component races when, uh, some, when they are needed, so to say. The next thing is that there is no leader of the Trolls yet, not even Rokan, and also none of the current leaders of the Horde have any family. The next thing is, uh, which I thought was kind of weird, that the Blood Elves, after the Scourge invasion of Quelphalos, now dislike ostentatious displays of, of luxury, which seems kind of weird considering how beautiful Silvermoon looks. Minor spoilers for a plotline of the book, I'll mark it on the screen for those who wish to mute the video until the spoiler is over, but in case something would happen to Anduin, Gen Greymain would become ruler of Stormwind. More minor spoilers, same rule, uh, but the eruption of the volcano on Kazan was not caused just by Deathwing and the Cataclysm, but rather by Gallywix's goblins mining so deep they found Azerite. The next thing is uh, that Stromgard is still in ruins, at least until it becomes a battlefield in Battle for Azeroth, Despite this, it still produces and exports cheese, since one of the uh, types of cheese, types of foods that Anduin eats at one point is called something something Stromgard. <laughs> uh, again, it could just be a type of cheese that is also grown some other places like uh, outside of Stromgard, but uh, who knows. The next thing is that Bran Bronzebeard has been retconned to be the founder of the Explorers League, Originally, it was Magni who founded the Explorers League. The next thing is that Azeroth, the planet and the Titan, has managed to uh, heal itself fully after the Cataclysm, but it cannot do so on its own after Sargeras' attack. It's such a severe wound. The next thing is that since the novel, The Shattering, Anduin has trained and is still training to become a swordsman, but is still not very good at it. The next thing is uh, something I don't I don't think it was specifically stated to be uh, uh, otherwise in the lore. I think it was just a sort of fan uh, deduction. But Alex Straza's mortal form is a high elf, not a blood elf. So go figure. More minor spoilers, same rule as before. Valera Sanguinar is Anduin's and before him Varian's personal spy. Which is a bit of a retcon since the novel *The Shattering* stated that she has, uh, she had then disappeared, with not even very knowing where she went. We obviously found out in Legion that she joined the Illuminati, but 
there you go. Minor spoilers again, uh, Bane, Bloodhoof and Anduin continued corresponding after Tides of War through Valera and Pair of Stonehoof. Also, Bane told Anduin that the Horde was forced to retreat from the Broken Shore and did not willingly abandon the Alliance there. Three big spoilers for a plotline, again I'll put a sign on the screen for when you can unmute. Before the Scourge, uh, Kalia Menethil married a foot soldier in secret and had a daughter with him, and both of, of them, the father and the daughter, were killed by the Scourge. The next thing is something we kind of inferred f uh, from before, but it's uh, expanded upon more. Stormwind and Lord, namely Stormwind and Lord Run, were extremely well connected before the Third War, and people traveled to and from the other. Uh, many families had branches in both kingdoms, etc., which is kind of interesting since uh, before the First War, Stormwind was stated to be pretty isolated from the other human kingdoms. It does make sense if you think about it since Stormwind's population took refuge in Lord Ron during the Second War, so they had time to intermingle, so to say. Next thing is that South Shore, despite being intact in vanilla, was apparently actually affected by the plague, meaning the Scourge Plague, not the Forsaken one. The next thing is that Archbishop uh, Alonzo's Fowl and Gen Greymane were actually, apparently, really good friends while the former was still alive, which is rather unexpected since they never interacted before in Warcraft media and Alonso's Fowl supported the alliance of Lord Ron while Gen Greymane was opposed to it. The next and final thing is that the city of Stromgard was apparently built by the Kingdom of Stromgard, not by the Arafi Empire. It's a small retcon, namely the previous lore was that Stromgard was founded by the Arafi under the names of Strom, and then the name was changed to Stromgard after the Kingdom of Stromgard was founded. Now, uh, going on to the spoiler section, I'm going to handle this video a little differently than I have my previous looks at Blizzard novels. Instead of going through the plot and telling my opinion on it while I am narrating it to you, I'm going to give an abridged version of it, without any op opinions necessarily, and then I'm going to discuss certain things I liked or disliked about the book. Uh, this little narration of the book will avoid certain spoilers, like for example, the resolution of one certain subplot of the story that's not necessarily relevant to the story of Warcraft as a whole, but it will contain full spoilers for things like Anduin and Sylvanas' role in the novel. So again, you have been warned. To begin, I have to say that the vast majority of the book, probably something around 75% or at least two-thirds of it, is centered around Anduin and Sylvanas, just these two characters and the various power dynamics around them. So keep that in mind for when I talk about the events of the book. In short, the book begins with a survey team of goblins discovering Azrite and Silphus, and then moves to the post-Legion victory celebrations and funeral for the Horde and the Alliance. Basically what you see in the two cinematics where Anduin and Sylvanas discover Azurite. At first the story revolves around sort of the aftermath of the War of the Legion, namely Anduin is preparing to visit all the Alliance cities in order to thank them for their support in the war, uh, Sylvanas is participating in ceremonies she hates for the Horde and such, and then Azurite comes into play. Anduin wants to use it for the benefit of everyone on Azeroth, Sylvanas wants to use it to kill everyone on Azeroth. Anduin realizes that Sylvanas would think of something like that, and tries his best to create, at the very least, the preconditions for a future peace between the factions. All of this is further complicated by the fact that Magni is visiting every single faction on Azeroth, including something which cracked me the hell, the hell up, uh, the centaur, in order to ask them to put aside their differences and focus on healing Azeroth because she's dying. The story then moves into five main plots, uh, four of which are connected and come together at the climax of the book, and one which is really pretty separate. The separate plot is the issue of Azerite, which after the events I mentioned moves into being about the researcher goblin and his partner do on the stuff. Sorry. 
Uh, this is the plot I will not spoil, even though it is honestly my favorite in the entire book, because it's not necessarily too relevant to the story of Azeroth. The most relevant things are the properties of Azerite itself. Uh, the other plots which are connected are, um, the first is the the fact that Anduin is working with Archbishop Alonsus Fow and the priest uh, Conclave to try at first to help Azeroth and then to find a way to start working towards peace with the Horde. The second one is Sylvanas working to maintain and tighten her grip on the Horde, all the while paying lip service to the whole saving Azeroth part, but actually just using it as a distraction to plan a war against the Alliance. The third one is the fact that the Forsaken, in Sylvanas' absence, have formed an interim gov governing uh, body for the Undercity, and many of the ones in charge want Sylvanas to stop raising new Forsaken and some even want to defect to the Alliance. The fourth one revolves around Kalia Menethil and her efforts to help Anduin, uh, her being uh, haunted by the events of the plague and such and so. Eventually uh, these plots collide in that Anduin, uh, after witnessing one of his older servants die and finding out that he has a relative in Lordran, a relative who is a Forsaken, decides to offer Sylvanas a one-day ceasefire where in the Arafi Highlands a select few Forsaken will be allowed to meet with a selection of their human relatives. Sylvanas reluctant reluctantly agrees and allows the members of the Desolate Council to go, because Nathanos, Blightcaller, argues that through this, either those who go realize that the living truly do not want them and will thus turn to Sylvanas all the more, or if it goes well, those Forsaken realize that the only one who can guarantee them future such meetings is Sylvanas, and, they, and then they will be all the more loyal to her. This gathering is also mediated by Alonsus Fowl and Kalia Menethil, although Sylvanas is unaware of the latter's presence. The gathering starts well enough, uh, some Forsaken are rejected by their living relatives and come back basically crying to Sylvanas, who pretty much rubs it into their faces about how wrong they were to ever think that the living would accept them again. <laughs> Most of the Forsaken, though, reunite happily. Uh, despite the m During the meeting, one of them notices that Kalia is who she is and decides to gather more council members in order to defect. Kalia then decides to reveal herself and support those Forsaken, since after all they are her people, and chaos erupts. Sylvanas and her Dark Rangers then kill all of the Forsaken left in the field, even the ones who are not trying to defect, and Sylvanas personally shoots and kills Kalia Menethil. She then has a standoff with Anduin where she basically turns the whole thing on him since he is the one who brought a would-be usurper to, the, to this mission of peace, and uh, I have to say that legally Sylvanas is right, morally of course what she did is repugnant, but Legally, she is in the right to do what she did. Anyway, uh, but she does not kill Anduin and even takes care that none of the citizens of Stormwind who came to the meeting are harmed, so that basically Anduin has no legal ground to stand on to retaliate. Anduin then brings Kalia's body, which miraculously does not decay, to another light temple, where the, Na where the Naru there, Sara, there has all the priests channel the light into her and she is reborn, resurrected, revived. Uh, the novel says that it is not resurrection per se, but that it also isn't necromancy. It basically says that Kalia is now a light undead or something like that. The novel then ends with Anduin and the relatives of the Forsaken who died uh, returning to Orafi in order to give those Forsaken a proper burial. Now, I think you can understand why I say that this book is not what I expected it to be, namely a prequel for, to Battle for Azeroth. It happens before Battle for Azeroth, it involves many of the characters who will be, who be important in Battle for Azeroth, and sets up some of the plot lines, 
but it pretty much doesn't lead into the events of Battle for Azeroth, unlike all the other novels Christy Golden has written in order to be a prequel for future, to future expansions. And I think the only one who has not received the prequel, the only expansion who has not received the prequel written by Christy Golden, uh, are Burning Crusade and Legion. Uh, anyway, this book is perhaps because of this misplaced, I guess you could say. It's a very well done exploration of what it means to be a forsaken and how the forsaken would relate to their living relatives how the living would relate then to their relatives becoming forsaken on that front it does a great job but that's honestly i think a story that should have been done in 2004 when the question was asked why these humans of lord ron who well are now undead would join the, the horde and not the alliance right now when at least I was expecting more background to the gigantic conflict between the Horde and the Alliance, which is said to happen immediately afterwards. Well, I feel like focusing more on the Horde versus Alliance aspects rather than on the Forsaken and some humans would have been a lot more fitting. Again, I'm not saying that this is a bad story, just that it is poorly placed. And if, like me, you are going into this novel expecting a Horde versus Alliance story, you are not really going to get that. The point the book excels at, though, is character interaction, and really, that is Christy Golden's strong point when it comes to books, uh, regardless of the franchise she writes them for. Maybe she's not at that good at, say, political turmoil, or tales about dragons or such, but when it comes to bringing out the quote-unquote human element in a story, or of making you empathize with uh, that mass murderer, for instance, she does that great. Uh, that and romance, which really is pretty much a trademark of any novel she writes. To be honest, at times I was expecting certain characters in, the, in this novel to fall in love, just because that is Christy Golden's style. And obviously nothing wrong with that, and again, she does this very well. And these parts were my favorite of the novel. Rather than the political intrigue or the fantasy and magic, what I like most about this specific novel is the small stuff, the character interactions, especially when it comes to the goblin plot, namely, I like that because uh, goblins are just so down-to-earth and amoral that their perspective on things, unlike the Arbo Tauren or humans or whatever, is kind of refreshing. On that note, one thing I dislike is, well, just how little the book focuses on the power dynamics of the Horde or on the interactions between the Alliance leaders. Now, when it comes to the Alliance, it's just more frustrating than anything else, since the book does have snippets of interactions between between them, which are obviously cut short when uh, compared to the other plots. But the Horde has the disadvantage, the disadvantage of being in a very tense political situation that isn't really expanded upon enough when it really should be. The Horde, other than Sylvanas, gets Gallywix be being Gallywix, the trolls having no leader and as such barely appearing even in the scenes where all the leaders are assembled, Bane being bullied into submission by Sylvanas, Lorthamar having only one scene where he basically nods that yes, he is loyal to Sylvanas, and Sarfang glaring menacingly at Sylvanas also only in one scene. Which I think you can gather is not really enough and is what I was expecting more of in this prequel to the major turmoil that is Battle for Azeroth. Now there's three topics that I should talk about regarding this book, namely Sylvanas, Kalia and Anduin, and I'm going to talk about them in the reverse order just because. <laughs> Anduin's is simple enough to discuss, like I've mentioned previously, he is my favorite character and he can do continues doing uh, what he does in this novel. It's also interesting that he matures more as a person and that Despite continuing to be an idealist, he is also becoming more pragmatic. Basically, the last lines in the, in the novel is him saying that he still believes that people can be redeemed and that there can be peace, but he believes that there, can, that there is no redemption possible for Sylvanas. Which is interesting, I suppose. Now, Kalia is an odd topic. Now... I liked her storyline in the book, in this book, I guess you could say, so the only point that needs to be addressed is its ending. I think it pretty much is a setup to establish her as a queen of Lordran because she's kind of undead, so she's forsaken, 
but she was also kind of alive, so she's a human of Lordran. She basically now straddles these two worlds, so symbolically speaking, she represents the entire population of the former kingdom of Lordran. Now, the problem with this is the method, this uh, light infused resurrection, but not re actually resurrection, but not necromancy, but not necromancy, w whatever. It's weird. Uh, characters in Warcraft rarely, if ever, get resurrected. I'm not talking, talking about necromancy here. I mean full-on resurrection, bringing them back to life. Real life, not unlife. So the, char the fact that Kalia gets this extremely unique treatment, even though it's technically not exactly resurrection, basically means that she's some kind of a chosen one, for lack of a better term like Ilden or Turalyon or Anduin were supposed to be at various points in the story. Because she gets to be this unique creature, not because that's what Anduin wants her to be or something, but because she's brought back by the Nar with the help of mortal priests. And it's kind of weird. Uh, if we were to have a chosen one again, <laughs> I'd kind of prefer to be a more established character rather than one we thought we'd never see again until the previous expansion. But anyway, I... I guess we're going to have to wait and see what, and see, wait and see, basically, when it comes to Kalia. Now, the elephant in the room that I have been avoiding and I want to run away from screaming, Sylvanas. <laughs> I'm going to preface this that, at least before this novel, I was not a Sylvanas hater, nor was I a Sylvanas lover. For the most part, I felt neutral, or I liked her character, with the exception of making her War Chief of the Horde, which was kind of nonsensical to me at best, and at worst, offensive fan service. And like I mentioned previously, I was hoping that the novel would expand a lot more on Sylvanas being War Chief and how this affects the Horde, because while I dislike the idea and its implementation so far, I'm still open to it to a certain point. Now I'm going to talk a, a little bit about Sylvanas in general, so you can get a bit of perspective on my point of view. You are of course free to disagree with me, but Please at least hear me out. If, say, Sylvanas was a full-on villain, with the likes of the Lich King, or of Deathwing, or even of Garrosh and Mists of Pandaria, then I would say that her characterization is not just good, but it would actually be great, perhaps even a work of genius. She's evil, but she's understandable in her goals and actions, she's cunning, and is a challenge to the good guys, she has personal tragedy in her backstory, she's perhaps misunderstood and conflicted, if she were a villain, then her story would probably be better than the Lich King's or of Deathwing's that I just mentioned. But even though she acts villainous, and Christy Golden does certainly portray her within character mostly, with the exception of the Alliance, everyone around her does not really seem to be in touch with the fact that she is evil. Which is a detriment both to Sylvanas' character and to the character of, the, of her allies. Because... Every one of her allies, who for the most part are not bad guys like she is, is expected not just to obey her, but to obey her without question, even to love her. With the exception of Sarfang, none of the Horde leaders ever challenge her in this novel. Instead, she sometimes bullies them into submission, even when they have shown no inclination of defying her. In the novel, Sylvana sometimes does not do certain things like have a victory parade, so that she does not go resembling Garrosh. But even Garrosh allowed open disagreement with his plans to take place, up to the moment when Vol'jin openly defied his orders, fair enough, but until then he did allow open discussion and disagreement of his plans. I'm not trying to con construct an apology for Garrosh here, I'm just saying that the only thing really that Garrosh has done worse than Sylvanas, is using the equivalent of a nuke, which obviously is not a small thing, but Sylvanas isn't really that far off with her use of the plague either. But while Garrosh was, also, was almost universally opposed from day one, I'm talking about the horde leaders here, not the fan base, Sylvanas is obeyed almost unconditionally. And that's my problem with how they are portraying her right now, instead of doing something interesting or even just retreading the old Garrosh story, they're doing something which seems nonsensical just for the sake of appearing cool. And this is why I desperately wish for the novel to tackle the subject more, because 
the more this remains untouched upon, the bigger the problem gets. In that sense, there is one way they subverted expectations in the, no in the novel, not necessarily in a good way, but there it is. Namely, when I first read of the Desolate Council, I expected them to be uh, something closer to a rebellious group, the likes of Putris and Veromophorus even, and Sylvanas does suspect them of that. But they are actually very reasonable people who love Sylvanas and are only governing under city until she returns. In fact, the main, their main hope was that she would return. They may disagree with her, like on the issue of raising new forsaken like that I mentioned, but overall they still consider her a good leader and that is perfectly fine and reasonable. It makes sense for Forsaken to consider Sylvanas a good leader, just not so much for the entire horde as a whole to do so. The council also really only begins considering defection when, despite Sylvanas' rhetoric, they realize that she does not exactly have their best intentions at heart, but rather her own. Now again, everything Sylvanas does in the novel is in character, and I don't mind that she does what she does. It makes her a loathable character, and but that is a good thing. Uh, if a character, I repeat, the character, not the characterization, gets an emotion out of me, it means it's a well-written one. If the characterization, instead of the character, gets the emotion out of me, it means there is a flaw in its writing that I am responding to. I will mention that there is one thing that you could maybe call an inconsistency in Sylvanas' character in the novel, although it doesn't really change much, namely the fact that uh, before, as shown in her short story in Cataclysm, she raised new forsaken and strengthened, strengthened her people because they were her, quote, bulwark against the infinite. Basically, they were her tools to protect her from true death. In this novel, that is not mentioned at all. Instead, rather she does all that because it, it's portrayed like as if she sees the Forsaken as something of an extended family, a family she's incredibly protective of to the point where any deviation is considered is considered an attack on her personally, a deep personal rejection of her which must be stamped out immediately, obviously. So instead of being a paranoid psychopath, she's a paranoid psychopath, so go figure. <laughs> Jokes aside, I feel that is more of Christy Golden's personal touch on the character since she always plays more on these kinds of human emotions when she writes her characters. Also another thing that subverted expectations in a good way uh, in the novel was that Nathanael's Blightcaller is actually written to be a reasonable person instead of Sylvanas' bootlicker, since he's actually nice to the Desolate Council and supports their desire to see their loved ones. Now he's still on Sylvanas' side, which is in character, but it was a nice thing to see uh, this particular character written slightly outside of his box. So overall, keeping all of these things in mind, I think I would still recommend the book. Now that I look at it, really, what I am disappointed in is in what it is not, rather than in what it is. And I would argue that I was justified in hoping to expect something else from the book, but nonetheless, if you keep in mind that this is not a Horde and Alliance story, but a Sylvanas and Anduin one, uh, and by extension a Forsaken and Human one, I don't think you will be disappointed. On the contrary, I would argue that it's quite good. So for those of you who have, who have not decided to crucify me yet for my opinions here, thank you for watching. Uh, leave any thoughts in the comments below and I will see you all later. Farewell.